What an amazing week six it was in the NFL. I mean, it wouldn't be an NFL week if we didn't have dud after dud on Prime Video. Golly, Thursday Night Football needs some help. But hey, at least week six ended with a banger with that Chargers and Broncos overtime victory by the Chargers. Dustin Hopkins and the heroics that he had, injured quad and all, led the Chargers to a 4-2 and two record. What we're going to be talking about on today's episode is the state of New York. The Jets, why are they so good when we had such low expectations for them? We're also going to be talking about some candidates that could be traded prior to the November 1st trade deadline on a brand new episode of Time to Football. Glad you guys are a part of it. My name is Hassan Khan, the host of this channel. If you guys aren't subscribed to this channel, I encourage you guys to hit that big red giant subscribe button because we come out with these podcasts every week. Tuesday night, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We premiere them. So throughout the duration of this show, chat with us in the live chat. I love chatting about football. Make sure you guys hit that subscribe button while you guys are at it. Follow me on Twitter as well, at It's Hassan Khan. We've had so much fun interacting with everyone uh, while the games have been going on during the weekend. Uh, but what we're going to be dissecting here today, the first topic that we want to talk about, the New York Jets. By the way, all these segments, these segments will be split up into their own different segments and videos throughout the duration of the week. If you wanted to wait for that, you were more than welcome to do that. The New York Jets are now 4-2 and two following a 27-10 victory against the Green Bay Packers. They showed up and they showed out in Lambeau Field on the road. Sauce Gardner walked off of Lambeau Field with a cheese head on his head promoting the Jets' defense and how great they are. Then Alan Lazard trying to make the fans happy. He's kind of irritated, knocked the head off. Uh, of Sauce Gardner, but that's okay. I mean, he has every right to boast. Gardner does. This Jets defense has every right to boast because they just looked really, really good. What has Robert Sala done for this New York Jets team that has made them so dominant, I want to say, on defense, especially for the last three weeks? The teams that they've beaten so far, the Packers last week, they've beaten the Dolphins, they've beaten the Steelers, and the Browns, the Steelers and the Browns, both comeback victories. So they're doing something right. And what exactly are they doing correctly that makes them so good? We want to talk about two players in particular and highlight them. To set up player number one, I think Daniel Orlovsky of ESPN said this perfectly. He tweeted out that there are two players right now that are currently the best players in the NFL. One, Josh Allen. And two, Quinnen Williams. Who the heck is Quinnen Williams? The bless you, thank you guy? Yeah, that's him. The guy when he was talking about Madden said that he liked to play with himself. Yeah, that guy. A guy that's a former top three pick. Yes, exactly. That guy. It took a few years for him to get into the player or become the player that he is right now. But man, is it paying off in, in, in year four. So far, five sacks through six games. For a DT, a defensive tackle. I'm not saying that he is Aaron Donald, but statistics-wise... The only defensive tackle that really gets double-digit sacks or is on pace to getting double-digit sacks is Aaron Donald. And Quinn and Williams already has five sacks through six games. The most that he's had in his career is seven, but that was when he played as a defensive end. So the trajectory of his career is he was drafted as a defensive tackle, started off as one, and then he kind of shifted towards defensive end. Sometimes still plays as D, uh, D end here and there, but he went back officially to defensive tackle and man, it has worked out with him lining up inside uh, and playing DT. So Quinton Williams is a big reason, probably the most important player on that Jets defense. Now, we're not forgetting about player number two that we want to highlight, and that is Ahmad Sauce Gardner. I mean, he is just locking down corners. You look at his statistics, it's like, okay, maybe he has like an interception here and there, but it's not nothing spectacular. But if you just look at what he does against some elite receivers – he does a very, very good job. Now, I will say in that game against the Browns, Garner did struggle a bit to stop Amari Cooper. He didn't shadow him 100% of the game, but still, like, Cooper had 101 yards receiving, and then Garner, when he was up against him, sometimes he allowed these big players here and there. But since then, like, he's really stepped up his game uh, to the point where the Jets secondary has locked down these elite wide receiver ones. I want to say Jets secondary and not just Garner, because like I said, he doesn't just shadow all these guys, 100% of the game, not like Patrick Sertan does uh, against Mike Williams this past Monday night. But still, he's still a big part in locking down these wide receiver ones. Jamar Chase only had 29 yards receiving against the Jets when they faced. And then Tyree Kill, who's on pace, might I add, to break Calvin Johnson's single-season receiving record. 
it was only limited to 47 yards receiving. So Gardner has really stepped it up, already developing into one of the better young defensive backs in the NFL, and he's only six games into his NFL career. So we can just give all the praise in the world to the Jets' defense, especially in the last three weeks. I love what they're doing. Gardner and Williams are two of the biggest pieces on that defense. Now, all the praise is to the defense, but we're talking about the Jets as a whole. So let's just focus in on the offense. What exactly are they doing right, and what exactly are they doing wrong? As good as Garrett Wilson has looked, as good as Brees Hall has looked, like what a revelation Brees Hall has been. Uh, as good as they've been, like they've still kind of teetered in the same area and the same kind of production as they've had in years past. Like nothing really too big has popped off from the Jets offense. But here's the crazy thing about that is it's okay. It's perfectly fine. Like this is the formula of the San Francisco 49ers. Robert Sala, the head coach who comes from the 49ers and that coaching tree is doing exactly what the 49ers do. Great defense, run the ball, and then don't really focus too much on the passing game. It's all going to figure itself out. When you need to pass the ball, you've got some great young receivers like Garrett Wilson. Uh, Elijah Moore's not really getting targeted that much. But Corey Davis, like you've got some good receivers in the passing game. But the focus should be on offense, running the ball, and on defense, just playing great defense, keeping the other opposing offense off the field, and you dominating time of possession. That is exactly the formula that Kyle Shanahan and the 49ers like to run. Robert Sala coming from the 49ers, is instilling that exact formula to the Jets. Zach Wilson coming back from a knee injury. I mean, he hasn't been looking the best, to be honest with you. I mean, one touchdown, two interceptions, 190 yards per game is his average. Not the greatest, but, I mean, he's doing enough to help the team win. Will he break out eventually? I don't know. But I think the Jets are at the point right now, and the fans as well are just saying, Zach, Take your time. We wanted, we expected so much with you being a number two overall pick. Maybe a breakout is going to happen. If it does, awesome. We love it. If it doesn't, like just do enough to help us win games. Just keep on doing what you're doing. Like take your time. If it needs to be a junior year breakout and not a sophomore year breakout, that's fine. But just keep us from losing games. That's it. That's all we ask as Jets fans. That's it. And Zach Wilson, I think they're okay letting him take his time, not putting too much on his plate. Brees Hall, looking great, takes a lot of pressure off of him. I really love the Jets, man. I really love the Jets. I love what they're doing. Do I think this is going to keep up? I honestly don't know. Um, I do think they do have some holes. Like, they're not 100% perfect. But, I mean, that statement victory against the Green Bay Packers, I know, Aaron Rodgers, uh, thumb, whatever. But still, like, it's impressive to go on the road in Lambeau and get that victory. It's impressive. So uh, leave your comments down below. I'd love to hear your thoughts and, and see what you guys think of the New York Jets. I really like them. I want to see what you guys think about the Jets. Now let's have a little bit of fun with this trade deadline segment. November 1st is the trade deadline, so we wanted to cover five players that could be traded to other teams prior to that deadline. Now, every year, rumors pop up with these big-name players, uh, but realistically, a lot of these players don't get traded just because with cap space and the draft picks, it just doesn't make a lot of sense for teams to trade for these players. So we want to focus in on five players that could realistically get traded, five big-name players that could realistically get traded. Player number one, I mean, it's already out there, Christian McCaffrey, the Panthers are already openly shopping. I don't want to say shopping, but like they're they're hearing, they're listening to what other teams have to offer. Steve Wilkos, I keep on saying Steve Wilkos. It's Steve Wilkes. Steve Wilkos is like, get off my stage, Steve guy. But Steve Wilkes as an interim head coach, Matt Rule was fired. Like this is already a, a rebuilding season for them. And they just, want, they just want to look ahead to the future. And if that means getting a lot of draft capital, because by the way, for the Panthers, they only have a first, a second, a fourth, and a fifth. Only four draft picks in 2023. So if they want to acquire more draft capital, you got to have to trade some big name players. I know that Brian Burns is brought up, but like realistically, like with the contract and like where he is, it's not really 
realistic for him. But for Christian McCaffrey, it is a possibility because this year a team would only have to pay like a little bit over $1 million. And then in future years, yes, you have to take on $20 million a year. But they can figure that out for themselves. Uh, but for the Panthers, they would take an $8.7 million cap hit, which sounds like a lot. And it is like a good chunk, but it's not like the end of the world if they trade them. So McCaffrey could get traded in some teams that could be interested. I know that the Bills were uh, openly trying to acquire Christian McCaffrey in the offseason. They were shut down. Uh, the Rams could be in line with Cam Akers being in the trade market. The Arizona Cardinals, the run game just hasn't looked great for them. They need to step up. Uh, Kansas City Chiefs as well could be in line for a new running back. So what is the compensation? I mean, nothing less than two high draft picks, I would say. Like, if you want to throw in a player and just one draft pick, sure. But two high draft picks, whether that be a first and a second, two firsts, I don't think you do it for two twos. Maybe they do. But I, I, I'm thinking like a first and a second at least. Uh, the Panthers would accept that for Christian McCaffrey. So, Again, throughout the duration of the segment, leave your comments. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Where do you think Christian McCaffrey would go, and what do you think that compensation would look like? Uh, the second player, let's stick with that team. Let's stick with DJ Moore. Uh, again, the Panthers need more draft capital, only four draft picks, and Moore, who hasn't been looking the best because of the poor quarterback play, could get traded. I know that they just traded Robbie Anderson to the Arizona Cardinals, so are they really like, eh, let's just shop our best receiver at this point? I mean, unless like DJ Moore's agency comes out and says, hey, we want to get shopped. We want to go to another team. We want a fresh start. We don't like the looks that we're getting, the limited amount of looks. Then sure, it could happen. But I don't think the Panthers go all out and trade Christian McCaffrey and DJ Moore. I think if anything, they trade one or the other and get some draft capital out of that. But I don't see them just getting rid of everyone at this point. For DJ Moore, I think the compensation that you could get out of him is maybe like a second rounder or a third rounder. That that seems like the right price, I would say, for DJ Moore. Uh, but anything less than that, I don't think that's happening. And anything more than that, I don't think he's worth a first round pick at this point. For the cap hit, it's only $6 million that the Panthers would have to take a hit on. Besides that, it's a contract that he is getting paid a lot of money. And the team that acquires him has to realistically pay that in future years. But if they're willing to, if they're willing to really invest in a young receiver that has a talent that just needs a new opportunity and needs more targets, DJ Moore would be the guy. Some teams that could trade for him would be the Baltimore Ravens. I know that's a rumor that popped up with Rashad Bateman dealing with injuries. I know that Devin Duvernay has really stepped into the role as a wide receiver too. But I mean, anything besides Mark Andrews at this point, like you need some help, right? And so the Baltimore Ravens could be a team that could invest. The Green Bay Packers have been talked about getting a receiver for so long. Uh, they might still be in the Odell Beckham market come mid-November, but it's looking like the Bills <laughs> seem like a favorite to land Odell at this point. Uh, so DJ Moore could be uh, a player being talked about by the Green Bay Packers. The Kansas City Chiefs could also use more receivers. Uh, the New York Giants as well. Uh, I, I know that their receiving core has been injured and as well, ha just hasn't been working out with Kadarius Tony and the limited amount of snaps that he's getting. Kenny Galladay, the four-year, $72 million contract, just not working. Uh, so the Giants, with them being 5-1, and one, honestly, like they could be going after uh, DJ Moore. And then maybe even the Tennessee Titans. I know that Traylon Burks has been put on IR. Maybe he's coming back. Robert Woods hasn't really been the Robert Woods of the past that he was with the LA Rams. So if the Titans really want to compete, I know the Julio Jones experiment didn't work out. So maybe they're kind of hesitant to to pay a high draft pick for DJ Moore, but it could be a possibility that Moore could go to the Tennessee Titans. Player number three that could be traded is Roquan Smith. I think this was kind of obvious uh, in the preseason when he flat out came out on Twitter and put out a statement saying like, hey, I love the Bears organization. I'm thankful for my time in the Windy City, but I am requesting a trade to get out of Chicago because they don't want to sign him to a long-term contract. He's one of the better young outside linebackers, even though technically he hasn't been voted as a second team, first team all pro, went to a Pro Bowl. He's still a very, very good defensive piece for the Chicago Bears. And he's so far proven it this season. Like he's playing like Roquan Smith, only 25 years old uh, in the last year of his contract. So if a team really wanted to trade for him, kind of like what the Eagles did for A.J. Brown, where they couldn't get contracts 
working out with the Tennessee Titans. So they said, hey, we will trade for A.J. Brown, and we will pay him as well. If Roquan Smith goes to a team that wants to do the same thing with him, that's a high possibility. Now, the team that he goes to, though, you got to keep in mind, they have to have a good amount of cap space. So it, it's kind of hard to tell at this point in 2023 who's going to have a lot of cap space moving forward just because a lot of these teams haven't really re-signed their big-name players. So it's really hard to grasp, but just looking at the perspective of uh, team fits and teams that are competing that need a young linebacker to really step up their game, the Baltimore Ravens have been talked about a lot. Uh, the Miami Dolphins, I will say, I'll throw them out there. The New York Jets could use more pieces on that elite defense that they have. And the Atlanta Falcons, I mean, don't count them out. Everybody expected them to be, what, 1-5 and five at this point? And now they're three and three. Could have been four and two if that play against Brady, whatever, that Grady Jarrett call. But still, like the Atlanta Falcons could be in the running for Roquan Smith, who played at Georgia. So, uh, you know, born and raised in Georgia. So uh, the cap hit that the Bears would take by trading away Roquan Smith would be $9.7 million. Again, sounds like a lot of money. But in the grand scheme of things, it's not like the Falcons eating up the cap space for Matt Ryan kind of money. Like it's a little bit less. So, He's going to be a free agent at this point. Might as well just get some draft capital for him. Um, I don't think that you get anything more than a second rounder for Roquan Smith. So a first rounder out of the table, but a second rounder, maybe like third rounder. Yeah, I could realistically see that happening. So kind of like DJ Moore, second or third rounder for Roquan Smith. Player number four, news that just broke out. Sean McVay actually just came out uh, and said, hey, yeah, we are at actively shopping K-Makers. We are listening to offers. We want to him to get a fresh start somewhere else. Just didn't work out. I don't know whether it's like the Achilles or uh, he's just frustrated with his role in the offense. Whatever it is, they are looking for another running back and want to get rid of Cam Akers. Uh, since he's only on his rookie deal, that's only a $1.6 million hit. So not bad. Not bad at all. And what makes Cam Akers a little bit more attractive is that he has two years left on his contract. So he's not going to be a free agent in 2023. 2024, is when he's going to become a free agent. So that kind of gives some teams a little bit more room to kind of see like a trial and error kind of thing. Hey, is Cam Akers going to really work out? I can trade like a low draft pick. I think honestly at this point, the Rams, with the way that Akers has played, uh, I, I honestly think they'd be okay with like a fourth rounder at best. And realistically, he might be like a fifth or sixth rounder that you get for Cam Akers. And some teams that could trade for Cam Akers would be the Atlanta Falcons. I mean, I know that they have Cordero Patterson. He's on IR, though, if you want to do like a running back by committee approach. Uh, I mean, like the backup running backs for the Falcons, Cable Huntley, Tyler Algier, sometimes they have their moments, but it just really hasn't been working out for them. So, I mean, you could pair Cordero Patterson with Cam Akers, and that actually might be a, a good one-two punch. Uh, and then I'll also say the Raiders, just because Josh Jacobs is on his last year with his contract, already declined the fifth-year option. The way that they're playing him is like, hey, we don't really – we're not playing you to preserve you for your future because we know that we're not going to re-sign you. So we need a new running back. And with two years on Cam Akers contract, it could be, again, in 2023, as a workhorse or first string running back, just play, just see what he has. And then let's see if we want to re-sign Cam Akers. The last team I want to mention that could be interested in Cam Akers, maybe this is a little bit of a stretch, but could the Rams and the Panthers do a Christian McCaffrey, Cam Akers kind of deal where the Rams are showing interest in Christian McCaffrey. The Panthers need a running back replacement if they do trade away McCaffrey, get Cam Akers. And I know that you can't just do straight up McCaffrey for Akers. So it would have to be, hey, I will trade Cam Akers and a second round pick for Christian McCaffrey. Cam Akers and a third round or whatever it may be, like a package deal for McCaffrey. That way, the Rams, obviously, they get an elite running back, a three-down back that you can use in several formations. And we know how talented McCaffrey is. There's no explaining. Like, the Rams are fine in that sense. For the Panthers, I mean, all you're left if you trade away McCaffrey is Chuba Hubbard and Deontay Foreman. Add in Cam Akers, do a whole running back by committee approach. Just see what Akers has. And then you have one more year left in this contract for 2023. Then you can utilize him as maybe like a workhorse or a first string running back. You get like extra time for Akers. You don't really pay a lot of money for him. He's still on his rookie contract. It could work out for the Panthers and getting Cam Akers in return. But, I mean, I want to hear your thoughts and your comments. Do you think Christian McCaffrey, Cam Akers, Panthers, Rams, 
kind of trade package deal could work out. Realistically, I, I don't see why not. And then the last player we want to talk about is another running back, and that is Josh Jacobs. We talked about him being declined his fifth-year option on the last year of his contract. I only see this happening, though. With the way that Jacobs is playing, I only see this happening if the Raiders continue to lose. They're 1-4 and four at this point. If they drop to 1-5, and five, do you think to yourself, hey, maybe we should trade away Josh Jacobs with the way that he's playing? And then maybe you could go to 1-6 and six even because there's two more games before the trade deadline. You could go to 1-6 and six and then be like, we got to get rid of Josh Jacobs. We don't have any intention of resigning him. His contract is going to be too expensive. With the way that he's playing, let's shop him to a team that is willing to pay him a long-term contract extension. And let's just get our hands rid of it. And let's get a high draft pick out of it. So I think the compensation you could get for Josh Jacobs, if he continues to play the way that he is, you could get a second round pick out of Jacobs. I don't want to say first round pick just yet because running backs are kind of, you know, dispensable, but you could get a second round pick for Josh Jacobs. So that's only if, again, if the Raiders continue to lose. And I mean, it's really friendly as far as the cap hit goes because. He's, again, just like K-Makers, he's on his rookie contract, so it's not that big of a hit. But those are five players that could be traded, realistically. McCaffrey, Moore, Rokon Smith, K-Makers, and Josh Jacobs. If you have any other players and any other team destinations you guys want to mention down below, I would love to hear your thoughts on where you think those players would go. To wrap up the show, we're just going to preview Week 7 here real quick. Uh, we just like to, every week, go through... Uh, each game and just give you our thoughts and notes and key injuries and things like that that we want to go over. Uh, so the buys, teams that have a buy this week, are the Eagles, the Rams, the Bills, the Vikings, the wrestling up this week. Uh, Thursday night football, hey, there's going to be some offense in this game, we hope. Because Thursday night, man, I'm like, huh. you know, just it's brutal, man. But Saints-Cardinals, we don't know if it's Andy Dalton. We don't know if it's Jameis Winston. Both of them are dealing with some injuries at this point. Maybe it could be Taysom Hill at quarterback. We don't know for sure. But uh, James Winston actually suited up last week. So keep that in mind. Like, he could have played if he wanted to, but they didn't elect him to play in that game. Andy Dalton played the entirety, and James Winston still recovering. They wanted him to be 100% before they make him the starter. But if Dalton is out with an injury, it could be the possibility that James Winston is starting in this game. Uh Chris Olave actually cleared concussion protocol news that just came out earlier today. So he's going to be playing in this game against the Arizona Cardinals. Uh, now we go to, from one team's receivers to the others and Arizona Cardinals are dealing with a lot of receivers uh, news. I would say first off, the good news is that Deandre Hopkins has been reinstated. He is eligible to play and more than likely he is going to be playing this uh, week, but Marquise Brown suffered a foot fracture. He's not been ruled out for the season, but uh, hopefully sometime later on in the season, he's going to be coming back. He's going to be out indefinitely. Uh, so they traded for Robbie Anderson, hoping that he makes some sort of impact. Uh, I will say Matt Am Amendola, who has been missing some kicks for the Cardinals, he's been released. Rodrigo Blankenship, who was waived by the Colts after missing a game-winning field goal uh, against uh, the Houston Texans in week one. He's been signed to the practice squad, so Blanket chip will be playing for the Arizona Cardinals. Uh, moving on to Sunday, Browns, Ravens. I mean, there's not really much to talk about except that the Rams, or I, I should say the Browns run game, uh, it seems like it's going to go back to normal against the Baltimore Ravens. Last week, they kind of struggled against the, the, the Patriots, and they were in a deficit, so they had to abandon the run. Totally understandable, but the way that this offense operates is they like to dominate time of possession, and especially in this game when you want to keep – or Lamar Jackson off the field, you got to dominate that time of possession. You got to run the ball effectively. It'll be back to normal for the Ravens. They're three and three. Didn't expect them to be at this point. I, I still believe that they are favorites, I want to say, to win the AFC North. Because if you look at the remainder of the schedule, like there are some difficult teams here and there, like the Bengals they have to face again, uh, the Buccaneers they have to face. I get it. Like there are some difficult teams, but for the most part, it's teams that they could easily beat. They could go 10 to 7. Uh, 11 and 6, 12 and 5, whatever, and lock in an AFC North championship. Uh, Buccaneers Packers, or Buc Buccaneers Panthers, I should say. Uh, Brady just hasn't been himself for the last two weeks. I mean, he's been looking decent, like no interceptions, a couple of touchdowns, 200, 300 yards passing, but 
nothing significant, not like the Brady of the past. And they're starting to get the receivers back from injury, however. And it's just, I mean, the Sears just played really good defense last week. That's all there is to it. Uh, so hopefully the Bucks are just hoping to turn it around against this Panthers team, which like the defense is actually like kind of up and down. So don't count them out. But for the Panthers, trade away Robbie Anderson after that whole altercation that he had. And then uh, P.J. Walker, Jacob Eason is going to be the starter this weekend. Probably Walker. I mean, he didn't really suffer a concussion, I don't think. They had to take him out of the game just because of the protocols. And, man, Tua, Tua just really changed everything, didn't he? Uh, not his fault. I'm um, Just the hits that he had. Atlanta Falcons versus uh, Cincinnati Bengals. Hey, man, the Atlanta Falcons are playoff contenders at this point. It, it's uh, some realities you just don't want to accept. You know, like the New York Giants, we didn't want to accept that they're a playoff contender, that they actually are good, but they are good. They're they're really, really well coached. For the Atlanta Falcons, we thought they were going to be one of five at this point, but they're playoff contenders. They're really, I don't want to say really good, but like the statement victory that they had against the 49ers, and then the 49ers had some injuries on defense, but Falcons, man, watch out for them. Come December, I will say at least, they're, they're going to be competing. Uh, for at least a wild card spot. Uh, the Lions Cowboys, man. Dak is returning more than likely this weekend. Uh, that QB controversy that people talked about, hey, Cooper Rush has won every game. Well, that was put to rest when he lost to the Eagles 26-17 to last week. There's no QB controversy. It's Dak Prescott. Like, the, the Cowboys would be this good, if not better, with Prescott under center. So no controversy, guys. No controversy. Amon or St. Brown more than likely will be returning in this game. Maybe even DeAndre Swift uh, may be back as well. So that'd be huge for the Lions. They need it against that tough uh, Cowboys defense. Uh, the Giants and Jaguars. For the Jaguars, man, two, two and four looked like they were looking good when they were leading, leading the AFC South. And then, I don't know, man, they dropped all these games and now they sit at two and four. So uh, they're hoping to get uh, Travis Etienne has been more involved the last couple of weeks. So maybe he's going to turn, turn into something, but it's going to be a tough game for the Jaguars offense. I'll go ahead and tell you that uh, for the Colts and Titans, uh, Matt Ryan last week looked like the Matt Ryan of the past, with the Falcons, like before the offensive of line issues and before Julio Jones was gone, like Matt Ryan looked like he was really, really good. And the last time that these Titans and Colts teams faced was back in week four, Matt Ryan had 350 yards passing in that game. Now, Alec Pierce has emerged as a wide receiver, too, for that team. I really like the Colts in this game. I I, I don't know if I – I don't want to count out the Titans. I really don't. But I, I'm going to have to be thinking about, like, who my pick is uh, for that weekly picks video this Thursday. Uh, Packers versus Commanders. Carson Wentz is out two to f- or, or four to six weeks, I should say. And Taylor Heineke is going to be starting uh, for the Commanders. Uh, Carson Wentz suffered a fractured finger – against the Chicago Bears on prime video, but a lot of you guys didn't see it because you're probably sleeping during that game. I don't, I don't blame you. I don't blame you. Uh, Aaron Rodgers has been playing through a thumb injury. If you want to talk about injuries to a hand, Uh, Matt LaFleur hinted that was the cause of the poor performance against the New York Jets. So let's just wait and see if Aaron Rodgers returns to his old form or if it really is like the thumb injury that's kind of holding him back or I don't know. I mean, this matchup against Commanders, Hopefully the Packers offense can get something going because the commander's defense just has not looked the best. Uh, the Jets versus Broncos, man, two good defenses Two. uh, the Jets offense is okay. The Broncos offense is just, oh my gosh, man. I, th- I would think you, you played Thursday and then you play again on Monday. It's not like you play Thursday and then I have Sunday game. No, you have an extra day, an extra week and a half. You have an extra week and a half and an extra day. To prepare than most teams for the Chargers, who on their secondary hasn't been looking good. And then Russell Wilson, first half, or first quarter, I should say, 116 yards. And then after that, barely anything. So, man, uh, gosh, Jerry Judy's visibly upset. Melvin Gordon, three carries, 10 yards. He got benched. It's a a nightmare, man. Nathaniel Nathaniel Hackett needs to get everything under control. Otherwise... He's going to be gone. He's going to be joining Urban Meyer of the recent head coaches that were fired in their first year prior to the season ending. I don't know, man. It is looking bad for the Broncos. Jets defense is great, though. Quinn and Williams and, and Sauce Gardner are doing 
amazing things. Uh, Texans Raiders, both these teams are coming off a bye. Both teams, teams had an extra week to prepare for their opponents. Uh, this is a must win for the Raiders. I mean, it's a must win for every team, right? That's involved with the Texans only having one win as well. But this is a must win for the Raiders, for sure. Like high expectations. This needs to happen. This needs to happen. Otherwise, when we talked about Josh Jacobs being traded, he could be traded if uh, a win doesn't happen in this week. Uh, Seahawks versus Chargers. Chargers, they survived the Broncos. Like, the defense of the Broncos is good. Uh, and, and it kind of hurt the Chargers. But, I I mean, they'll have a little bit more breathing room against the Seahawks and their poorest defense, who actually didn't look that bad against the Cardinals, but it's the Cardinals. Like, the Cardinals in the first half just don't look good. But, you know, Geno Smith was on a hot streak for three weeks. Kind of sizzled down last week against the Cardinals. But, uh if anything, Kenneth Walker is the truth. So if they want to lean in on anything, it's Kenneth Walker. The run defense of the Chargers has been bad for the last three weeks. Walker, he's the truth. He looked great last week. So ride with Kenneth Walker if Geno Smith and DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett, all those guys don't work out. Uh, Chiefs versus 49ers. This should be a very good uh, game. A rematch of Super Bowl 54. The 49ers defense did miss a few players last week. We talked about that. That's why the Falcons looked really, really good. Uh, they're still recovering, so you know it's it's going to be tough for the 49ers defense. I, I highly doubt that they're going to make a big impact in this game because if last week taught us anything against the Bills, I know that Patrick Mahomes threw the game-ending interception, but still, like against the Bills defense, throughout the majority of that game, he didn't look that bad, and the defense is regarded as the best defense in the NFL, probably up there with the Eagles. And against the 49ers, like, I mean, if, if you did that well against the Bills defense, against the 49ers, that's a little bit banged up, should do some uh, some damage against them. Uh, Steelers versus Dolphins. Uh, let's talk about the Steelers' offense first. Kenny Pickett will start the game if he's clear. This was announced by Mike Tomlin. Uh, Mitch Trubisky, I will say, he was benched uh, for Kenny Pickett, not because of poor performance, but Mitch Trubisky was actually benched because he got an argument with Deontay Johnson. Johnson, during halftime, was saying, listen, I don't like how you're not throwing me the ball. And they got into a heated argument, apparently. And uh, that caused uh, Mike Tomlin to make the decision to put in Kenny Pickett. So I, I don't think he strays away from that decision. If Pickett clears concussion protocol, he is in. Um, I, I wanted to say Deontay Johnson was like a trade candidate. I almost put him down. But again, I just want to talk about realistic trades. Uh, and, and they can't trade him. Like, they just signed him to a two-year contract extension. And if they get rid of Deontay Johnson, they have to take a cap hit of $16 million this year. I highly doubt that the Steelers uh, are going to do that. But for the Dolphins, Tua Tagovailoa has cleared concussion protocol. He's going to be starting in this game. But don't... Like, just hear me out. Don't expect a lot of great things from Tua this week just because the linebackers coach of the Steelers is Brian Flores. He used to be the head coach of the Miami Dolphins, who's a very good defensive-minded coach. The reason why the Dolphins' defense the last two years, last three years, has looked great, the reason why he's been able to make all these turnarounds when he started 1-7 and seven or whatever it was, he knows how to make a defense do well. So... He's not the defensive coordinator. He's not going to be calling the plays. But do you believe that the Steelers are going to be coming up to Brian Flores, asking for a little bit of advice and kind of picking his mind, being like, hey, any tips and pointers on how to stop Tua? Absolutely. Absolutely. So Brian Flores is going to be that deciding factor in stopping Tua Tagovailoa. So that's why I don't expect like this amazing high-scoring performance like he had against the Baltimore Ravens. The Steelers defense, who looked good against the Bucks last week, might contain Tua a little bit more. And then finally, the Monday night football game between the Bears and the Patriots. Uh, quarterback controversy. Is that going on in New England between Bailey Zappi and Mac Jones? I mean, four touchdowns to one interception for Zappi. Mac Jones, I mean, I, I think a lot of New England fans are frustrated that the offense just can't move down the field. With Zappi, it's not like that big of a difference. They still rely heavily on the run game with Ramondre Stevenson uh, and Damian Harris when he's active. I don't know, man. I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments. Do you think that Bailey Zappi should be the quarterback moving forward? Um, I, I don't, me personally, I don't think so. I think they go back to Mac Jones. But in the meantime, while Jones is still recovering from that high ankle sprain, Zappi has been looking great. For the Bears' offense, however, from one offense that's dealing with a controversy 
of some sort in a good way to another controversy with the uh, uh, Bears offense. The controversial part of them is just their offensive line is just not good. And Justin Fields has like no time to throw. He always has to skip the pocket and receivers are not helping at all. I will say, Darno Mooney though, I think there was a report out there saying that the Bears are interested in keeping him long term. So uh, when I talked about Rokon Smith being a trade candidate earlier on the show, you need to trade him. You need to trade him. You need to get more picks. You need to get an offensive lineman. You need to get receivers. You need to help that that offense because, man, they went so defensive heavy in the uh, draft this past year. People were like, man, what about the offense? Like, you need to get Justin Fields some help. Like, it's not really working out. Uh, this is the year where they really hone in on that. Uh, but that's going to wrap up this episode of Time to Football. I appreciate you guys joining us. Again, every week, Tuesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Make sure you guys subscribe to this channel so you can stay up to date when this podcast comes out. Uh, and follow me on Twitter as well, at It's Hassan Khan. I'd love to chat with you guys throughout the duration of the games. Uh, who's your favorite team? You know, let's just talk about football. Like, uh, and, and leave your comments down below about all the segments that we talked about. Again, these segments will be split up and put out uh, throughout the duration of this week on this channel. With all that said, thank you guys so much for watching this episode. And I'll see you next week. Take care.